Sonic Underground episode 27, Six is a Crowd. We start out in a snowy tundra with some beautiful music to suit it, and Sonic is burrowing through the snow with his siblings and insists he's very familiar with these mountains that we've never seen him in before. At least I don't think we have. I love that they're wearing winter clothes again. Suddenly, they run into a Yeti, not that it matters as Sonic runs away. That was pointless. Eventually, they get through the purple waterfall without having to go into a cave and fall through a trap door this time. At least they remembered it was in a snowy area, so that's why Sonic knew to come here. The Oracle, who surprisingly gives them chili dogs, is glad they brought the snow globe. Sonic lampshades that he never gives a straight answer. If they knew this was a problem, why write him like that? So far, their visit to the Oracle hasn't helped them at all. He uses his magic to show them green light, no, not to take down Robotnik, but instead to teleport them away, with them saying something about seeing their own future. Sonic flies with the medallion and says that it's coming from this way, and he runs with them to go to the good future he was destined to create, which has hover cars and shiny white buildings. Clearly not looking like an evil place at all. So there goes all the tension of the show, because we know for a fact that the heroes succeed. Unless the Oracle set them to a simulation of the future. Sonic is happy to see a statue of himself, but he wonders why there's a bulge on his body. It must be because of all the chili dogs. A woman gasps at seeing him and backs away, bowing. Sonic says his coolness precedes him, and I immediately assume that the twist is that Sonic is feared as a villain. Well, after all, why would she be scared, and how did he not notice that? Sonya looks menacing in her statue. I love this episode already. But seriously, how does she not immediately get suspicious? Then we see a chili dog vehicle move around, and Sonic goes up to it. The chili dog stand guy says he can eat all he wants, free of charge, looking scared. And for fuck's sake, we see another Robotnik! And he sees all three hedgehogs in binoculars and without their bodyguards. Because apparently they're pathetic enough to need bodyguards. What? Why is there anyone like Robotnik here? This is tedious. And the chili dog owner shoots Sonic so that he can't move. This is confusing. Why would it look like a good future if it's ruled by dictators anyways? Sonya whirlwinds and steals a ray gun that she should always have to paralyze the robots and free Sonic, and Manic drums. Seriously, why would the place look so nice? They see a Robotnik with a wig corner them and kidnap them as they're paralyzed. He calls Sonic Sire and says that the revolution is over. Manic jokes, and Robotnik says that Manic took away their money, Sonya took away their freedom, and Sonic took away the music. I doubt that. He's just joking, right? They, they clearly ran out of ideas for what Sonic would take away as a dictator. Maybe if he said, you took away our chili dogs. But other than that, that doesn't make any sense. Manic is a thief, and so he gets money. I get that. And Sonya could be a control freak. But Sonic? What would he do? What would he take away? He says that his freedom fighters shall live free, even though we never see any other freedom fighters with them, unless he's talking about his robots. And he's talking as if he's a hero, even though he intentionally gave himself black and red eyes. Either that or in this alternate dimension, he was forced to have black and red eyes by villains in the hopes of making him not trusted anymore. We see Anti-Sonic say to destroy Sector 3, and anti manic says to double the taxes in Sector 9. And evil Sonya says to throw someone in the dungeon for some reason. Sonya says that her twin's gown is so last season. Either in this dimension, that's not true and it's up to date in the fashion. Or... Well, why, why would it be true? Why would her more fashionable, like, fashion-obsessed self have a last season gown? Robotnik realizes these are the good guys because he sees the evil twins on live camera footage. And because the heroes play music, well, for no reason at all, their evil twins hate music. That's the one thing about them that's utterly stupid. It just tries to make them look evil 
in a lazy, stupid way. Otherwise, these are the perfect evil twins. Like, these are the best versions of the evil twins and the main heroes in any continuity. Because they're like them. And it makes sense for them to turn out this way. Sonic decides to impersonate his evil twin. As Sonya says the robots to just open the gate already, and Sonic fires them. I can only guess that the robots were just confused that Sonya was outside and not inside like she was supposed to be, and that's why they took so long. Anti-Sonya gets mad because her servant stuck her with a pin. It makes sense that she would be afraid of getting stabbed by it. And because a poor person begged Manic for money, Manic says to put him in chains. The poor person is only there for the sake of making Anti-Manic look evil. Because why would anybody go ask these people for money? Then Anti-Sonic yells that these were the worst chili dogs he ever tasted and orders the chef to be imprisoned. Once again, this is only happening to make him look evil. Huh? Wouldn't chili dogs sold to royalty be amazingly tasty? Sonic lets the guy go and takes advantage of the opportunity to be a dick again by telling the robots they're fired and so are all the other guards. Then he greets Anti-Sonic, calling him cousin, and stomps on a plate to steal his chili dog. Anti-Sonic is scared and stunned at seeing him, and when he's told that he's what he should have been, he calls for the guards instead of asking how he could possibly exist and where he came from. Sonic challenges him to a race. Anti-Sonic hides a ray gun behind his back to cheat, obviously planning against him. Anti-Sonic shoots him with a paralyzer after letting him run ahead, being pretty smart. He's kind, kind of looks smarter than Sonic because Sonic didn't think he'd do that. But how is he supposed to know he'd even have a paralyzer with him? He stays in the, in the palace all day. Why would he be holding a gun at all times? We see Manic stealing money bags. Which one is this? He looks just like Manic. Aside from the anti-Sonic, they all look the same. Manic looks scared at seeing the machine suck up gold coins and jumps on them, telling it to stop. Why? Oh, he calls for the guards, so he has to be the evil one. And Manic is the one in the machine. So, where'd that machine come from? How do you... How do you operate it? Manic says he doesn't... Anti-Manic says he doesn't steal from the poor. Uh, Manic says that he doesn't steal from the poor. And Anti-Manic says that he doesn't steal, he taxes. Manic smirks, saying not anymore, which is charming, and he vacuums him so he gets stuck. Then anti Sonya asks for her mirror, and the good Sonya confuses the servant with her presence, and she walks away without saying anything. I guess she doesn't want to get in trouble. Sonya stands in the fake mirror on the other end, and somehow anti Sonya takes a trillion years to realize it's not her in the mirror, considering that Sonya's dressed in a different outfit. This is stupid. Anti Sonya faints in response to Manic's presence with the machine. I love that Anti-Sonia has a different outfit, and Anti-Sonic is kind of chubbier because he eats chili dogs. Then he says that he called his guards, but wait, Sonic fired them! They shouldn't show up! Kenzo 4 frees Sonic by using a ray gun, and the Sonic start racing. I know he's not, I, I know he's not called Kenzo 4, and they're not called Anti, but fuck it. I like the names, and I like the concept in Archie. Anyway, Sonya wishes that she could show the evil twins what it's like to live in the underground. I immediately assumed that this would happen. Kento Boy says that they're so arrogant that they haven't left the palace in years. Sonic decides to get his evil twins a tour to show them what their city is like. Years of their taxes put some people out of business. As the truck goes down the road, the evil twins look sad at seeing the slums they helped create. I love this episode so much! This is, this is awesome! Anti Sonya sees a poor kid who's only here to make her feel sorry for her. And she wells up with tears and gives her some gold. Which, uh, I guess, would that make her get mugged for the, the gold? I hope she has enough time to sell it to someone first. But that someone could just beat her up in exchange for getting the gold for free. I mean, they never left the palace. And really, they're just spoiled children. That's all. It's not like they're complete psychopaths who kill people for fun. <laughs> <laughs> They well up with tears and show compassion. And Kintobor says that there's one more place they need to see. They walk in a park where anyone is allowed to sing and play music. Basically, the knot hole. Sonya says that she used to play and sing when she was younger, and so did her brother. 
which one? And Kentivor says that he remembers that and laughs. Cause, cause he, he remember. Anti Sonic tells his audience that they're gonna have peace and prosperity from now on, and chili dogs for all. And everyone forgives him, apparently. I mean, technically they're not evil enough to be proper evil twins. This was really easy, but I like getting to see this. They're not total cliches. The heroes run off, as I wonder how the audience would forgive these tyrants so easily after years of tormenting. They stop because they hear Sonya's mom's voice. What happened to Sonic's mom in the Antiverse, by the way? She died, I guess. And their, and their father, too. Elena says she's proud of them and she loves them and a hologram of herself that she thought to bring here for some reason. And she still doesn't apologize for ignoring them or explain why she's doing this to them. Sonya cries. I immediately think about how it's Elena's fault that she's crying. And they all hug her. Why is the mother apart from them and how does she know to put this hologram message here and say this exact thing? Is this pre-recorded? She's gotta be working with the Oracle. This was a surprisingly brilliant episode. Well, it did start on a bad note because once again, the Oracle's worthless and does nothing to help and just wastes the hero's time testing them pointlessly. It was really enjoyable to see them get sent into what they thought was the good future of Mobotropolis that they helped create. The game was given away the second we saw Mia's mean-looking statue, though. And she should have realized that something had gone wrong, because why would she want a mean-looking statue of herself? I'm glad that rather than them being as adults who somehow got corrupted by power and became weak enough to have bodyguards everywhere, we actually got to see the Antiverse. And it's not like they're evil for no reason and doing counts of evil things that their counterparts wouldn't do for no reason. They're just spoiled rich kids. They have such perfect lives that they don't know what a real problem is, and so they completely flip out at the most minor of things, because they're looking for something to complain about. And they like their palace, so they don't leave it and go see what their kingdom is like, because they'd feel like regular people if they walked around it normally. It makes sense that they don't leave without their bodyguards, because they aren't freedom fighters who get tons of combat training as a result. And plus, Kinto Boar is always after them. Anti-Sonic is chubbier because he just sits around eating chili dogs and did that his whole life. So even though he knows he can run just as fast as Sonic, he eats more. I guess he's fine with just running around the palace because it's so big. So he doesn't need to go outside. anti Sonya has a beautiful princess outfit, having the materialistic fashionista thing in common with her. I really, really hate that she didn't immediately know it wasn't her in that fake mirror. Because she'd know what she was wearing, and she'd know that it looked nothing like her outfit. And plus, there was no way they'd both move in the exact same way at the exact same times, and thus be able to mime each other perfectly for all that time. That's a really stupid gag, and I hated that in Sonic Generation 2. It was, it was just complete padding. But that was just a dumb gag. All the proof that Rule of Funny is never good storytelling. Anti-Manic was the only big problem design-wise, because he looked exactly the same when he's the one who grew up rich. So he shouldn't still be dressing like a poor rebel kid. And the idea that they all hate music and ban it is complete bullshit. The brain doesn't work like that, and it's even more stupid considering that apparently they used to like music and they played it. So why did they stop? Rich people had music, the piano and stuff. And why would Anti Sonya's servant try to stick a pin on her? Was she new and Anti Sonya was too stupid to just tell her what not to do? I guess so. I guess she had just fired her old servant for a stupid reason. But sometimes it seemed like the evil things they did were arbitrary. Why was that poor person even there? Anyways, it was really brilliant and subversive that when the evil twins were shown the slums of their city and saw a sad poor kid, they actually started crying and had the same amount of compassion as anyone would. Oh, poor little girl. <laughs> <laughs> they're just they're just spoiled rich brats, not completely pure evil. And this makes much more sense because they have the same DNA as their good counterparts. So they have the same potential as them. They should be just like them biologically. And the only difference is that they had a cushy upbringing. I guess their parents died and that's why they got all the power and went nuts with it. 
They had no parents at the time to guide them correctly. While it was really easy to confer all of them at once to good, to the point where I was suspicious, I was so blown away that it actually happened to subvert the evil twin cliché that I forgave it. It made sense. And the Archie evil twins would have made sense too if the writers bothered to explain that they had horrible parents who would make them grow up bitter and lashing out at the world. That's probably why Scourge went evil despite being an alternate counterpart of Sonic. Because having a cushy world to grow up in that doesn't have Robotnik ruining it isn't a good explanation on its own. Because the anti-Sonic here had the same cushy world, but he became good because he's still Sonic. Scourge must have a really good reason for why he isn't like that then. My point is that really evil twins aren't doomed from the start. They just need to have a very clear reason for why their lives had them turn out like that. And abusive parents is the only one I can think of. These kids right here show no signs of that. They aren't bad melting their parents at all. It was a huge missed opportunity to not see the anti Alina. Because if she had been evil, raising her kids to be spoiled snobs, it would have given them a better foodie and excuse. And it would have been a disappointment to the Freedom Fighters because they'd see her, but she'd be evil. So even though this is a filler episode, the what episode isn't an episodic show, I still ended up really liking it. And it's probably going to be my favorite of them all. I was not expecting to see evil twins in a Sonic continuity ever again. I'm glad it wasn't just about showing the heroes the good feature they made so they can waste time in it, and it's making their victory even more of a foregone conclusion. I saw Kintobor and I started wondering if Robotnik had a son in the future who looked just like him because of laziness. His design sucks because he still has evil looking eyes, so he doesn't make enough of an impact as a good Robotnik. He even has, he has evil looking robots and everything. 